What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to the episode of Primetime Sports Podcast, hosted by Joey May Larry. So this episode, I'm going to talk a lot about the MLB. I haven't really done too many MLB episodes over the last month or two. I've been obviously locked into the NBA and NFL season, so I haven't really talked too much baseball. So this is going to be a big catch-up episode. I know I already mentioned Shohei Otani's deal with the Dodgers when it first happened. Didn't really get to talk too much about the deal and the money and obviously what that Dodgers lineup is going to look like. So I'm going to talk about that deal. I'll talk about the Dodgers going all in, not only getting Shohei Otani, but getting Tyler Glass now in a trade and signing Yoshinobu Yamamoto to a 12-year deal. I'll talk about all of those deals that they've made over the last couple months. And then after that, I'll move on to talking about the Red Sox and also talk about some other things going on in the game of baseball, including the Baltimore Orioles making a big trade over the last couple of days and getting Corbin Burns, a new ace to them in their rotation from the Milwaukee Brewers. So let's start off with the Dodgers going all in. They gave Shohei Otani a 10-year, $700 million deal. And the crazy part of this deal, obviously making $70 million per year is nuts. But even crazier is the fact that the Dodgers are deferring most of that money. Shohei Otani's only going to make $2 million per year for the next 10 years. With $680 million deferred from 2034 to 2043. In that window between 2034 and 2043, they're going to be paying him $68 million per year. So obviously, the $700 million he's going to get, but a lot of it is stretched out over time, which proves that Shohei was just happy giving the Dodgers flexibility to go out and add talent, and clearly his preference is to win right now. And that's obviously the Dodgers' preference as well. He'll get his money later on, but he wants to win right now. He also has a clause in the deal that he can opt out if the owner decides to sell the Dodgers' team or if the general manager is gone. So it obviously gives flexibility for the future as well. He has an opt-out if those two things were to happen. If either one of those two things were to happen, I should say. It's the largest contract in sports history. More than Leo Messi's $673 million deal with Barcelona. That's just crazy. $700 million, the largest deal in sports history. And it shattered the North American sports history record. And I thought Shohei would make a good amount of money. I was thinking, I think I was around 50 or $60 million per year for like a seven-year window, maybe eight years. I didn't see him getting $700 million. And that doesn't mean Shohei doesn't deserve it. He's an absolute unicorn, an absolute superstar, and draws fans to the game of baseball, even if they're not a big fan of the game. Just having the opportunity to watch Shohei Otani in person, whether you're seeing him on the road or at a home game back when he played with the Angels, or just seeing him on TV. Every single night that Shohei Otani steps on that field, there's a chance that history can happen. Whether it's him on the mound, him on the plate, Shohei always draws attention to the game just because of how talented he is. So he's making $700 million, not just based on what he's going to do in the field, but obviously all of the attraction that's going to be sent the Dodgers' way now, which the Dodgers are a big market team. Everybody knows the Dodgers spend money. Everybody knows the Dodgers are a big team that people love to follow. The Dodgers have a big fan base. And now that fan base is going to grow even more because Japan's team now in the MLB is going to be the Dodgers. They have Yamamoto and Otani. People are going to be tuning in every single day and night to watch those two play. And one tough thing about this deal is that I honestly thought there was a chance that the Angels were going to re-sign Shohei Otani. I really did. Going up to the last day when he signed with the Dodgers, I thought the Angels had a shot. And the Angels did have a chance to actually match the offer that Shohei got. Supposedly, the Dodgers offered $700 million, and Shohei didn't accept it right away. He went back to the Angels and said, if you could match this offer, he would go back to Anaheim. But supposedly, they declined. The Angels weren't willing to give him that money. And that's on the own Adi Moreno, in my opinion. That's not on Perry Manasian. I'm sure he would have paid him, even if it was $700 million. It really comes down to the owner being willing and down to spend that money. And it seems like Adi Moreno didn't want to do so. He didn't want to give Shohei Otani $700 million. And as a result, Shohei ends up going over to an Angels rival. And now he's in L.A. with the Dodgers. And that's not what Adi Marino probably wanted. He was probably hoping Shohei ended up in Toronto or with the New York Mets or even the San Francisco Giants. But the reality is this. The Angels had a chance to prevent Shohei from going over to the Dodgers. They could have brought him back to Anaheim and given him that $700 million deal. But that's not something they were willing to do. And at the end of the day, I think the Angels will figure things out at some point. I don't think they're going to be bad forever. Even though they're struggling right now and obviously... Haven't won a playoff game since 2009. Things will turn around at some point. I mean, sports are a cycle of winning and losing. They've obviously had a bad losing trend now over the last 10 to 15 years. And it is disappointing that they didn't really get to do too much with Mike Trout with Shelly Otani. But one thing I could say is this. I appreciated those two players playing together every single night when they were on TV. 
I watched. When I had the opportunity to see them play at Fenway, I went this past year. When I could watch a game on my phone in the MLB app, I took advantage of that because I knew that these two superstars would have been in the same lineup forever. So I cherished those moments and took the opportunity to watch them any chance I got. And I know people are going to look back on Perry Manazian, the GM of the Angels' decision not to trade Shohei Otani at the deadline, and they're going to say that was an awful decision. But here's what it comes down to. If Shohei wanted to stay at the deadline, it's hard to move him. Especially if he's buying into a team that's three games out in July at the deadline, and Shohei believes that this team can make a run and he wants to stay in Anaheim, obviously you're going to want to keep him. And if the Angels did decide to trade him, they weren't going to bring him back in free agency. So that would have crossed off their chances of bringing back Shohei on an extension. Keeping him past the deadline gave the Angels a chance to get him in free agency in my eyes. And the Angels were right there. I expected them to be there. And that's because Shohei loved this Angels team. He enjoyed his time in Anaheim, and that's why he gave them a chance in the end to match the offer. He even wanted to play through an injury last season. After he suffered that elbow injury, he still wanted to hit and still show up for the team because he knew that the Angels needed him out there. He really enjoyed his time in Anaheim, and obviously things didn't work out, but I'm happy I was able to see those two guys play together, Trout and Otani, because it was just special being able to watch those two superstars be in the same lineup every single given night. The amount of fake reports, though, were wild about Shohei's decision. There was a report at one point that Shohei was very close to signing with the Blue Jays, and that's because somebody saw a private jet going from L.A. to Toronto, and there was a report on Twitter that Shohei's flying to Toronto to sign a deal. And the crazy thing is this. That private jet didn't even have Shohei in it. It was Robert Herjavec of Shock Tank, not Shohei Otani. And the same goes for Yamamoto. There were so many crazy reports about him and what he was signing. So many false reports. But obviously, those reports were both false about Shohei and Yamamoto not going to the Dodgers. And now they're both in L.A. together playing on the same team. What a 1-2-3 punch though in that starting lineup for the Dodgers. Mookie Betts, Freddie Freeman, Shohei Otani... That's a crazy 1-2-3 punch. And then you added Will Smith, Max Muncie, James Outman. Outman, I'm very high on. I think he's having a great season this year. But the Dodgers didn't just stop at Shohei. They added even more. Andrew Friedman and the Dodgers have a relentless desire to win, and they don't care what the cost is, whether it be top prospects in a big trade or opening up the checkbooks for record-breaking deals. They don't care what the cost is of winning. And that's why I've always respected this Dodgers team. They have a relentless desire to win, and not only are they winning and spending a lot of money on their payroll, they also have a great prospect pool at the same time because they're great at developing minor league talent. They take prospects and develop them the right way in the minor league system, and then by the time they get to the MLB, a good amount of them are top prospects on MLB Pipeline. So in this deal with the Rays, the Dodgers got Glasnow and outfield and Manny Margot. In return, the Rays got Ryan Pepio, a 26-year-old right-handed pitcher, who is a former top 100 prospect for the Dodgers. He's under control through 2028. The Dodgers also sent Johnny DeLuca, a 25-year-old outfielder, who is also under contract for a long time. He's under contract through 2029. In return, as I said, the Dodgers are getting Glasnow and Manny Margot. The Dodgers' issue last season was pitching. And the biggest problem with their pitching staff was health. Walker Buehler was hurt. Dustin May was hurt. Tony Gonsolin was hurt. They had a lot of injuries to their pitching staff. Their pitching staff last year had a 4.57 starting ERA, which is their highest as a pitching staff since 1944. In the NLDS, they had a 25.07 ERA from their starting pitches. And like I said, they had a lot of injuries. So there are some excuses, but at the same time, having their highest starting ERA since 1944 is embarrassing. So the Dodgers knew they had to go out and make a big move and get a pitcher. And Glass now had a good season last year. 10-7 and seven record for Tampa Bay. 3.53 ERA in 21 starts. He has battled injuries over the last couple of years, but the talent is there. And also, to make things better for the Dodgers, not only are they getting Glassnow for this upcoming season, they also signed him to a five-year, $136 million extension. So obviously, he has to stay healthy over the next five years, but if he were to stay healthy, that $136 million extension is going to be worth it. But at the same time, if he does get hurt and he's battling injuries like he has over the last couple of years, that deal could come back and hurt them. But the Dodgers knew they needed more pitching this season. And that's why they went out and got glass now. And then Margot will now be an outfielder probably that's going to probably be off the bench for a good amount of games. They're going to be adding Mookie Betts to their infield though at second base. So it doesn't open an outfield spot. Margot didn't have a great season last year for Tampa Bay. Just four home runs, a 264 batting average, and a 686 OPS. 
As for those guys that went from the Dodgers to the Rays in the deal, DeLuca made his MLB debut in 2023, hitting 262 for a batting average and 45 plate appearances. He did really well in double A and triple A. He had a 956 OPS over 73 games between double A and triple A. And obviously he's a young player as well, only 25 years old. As for Ryan Pepio, he's a young player who's very talented, 26 years old. And one thing we know is that Tampa Bay is very good at developing pitching talent. Last year, Pepio was pretty good for the Dodgers. He made three starts and eight appearances with a 2-1 record, a 2.14 ERA, and overall in his MLB career, in 17 games he's appeared in, he's made 10 starts with a 3-1 record and a 2.76 ERA. Watch him go to the Rays and be a Cy Young candidate in the next two to three seasons. That's always the way things go with the Rays. They always find pitching talent and they always develop guys the right way that end up being great MLB starters. So the Dodgers didn't just stop at Otani and Glasnow. After that, they went out and got Yamamoto on a 12-year, $325 million deal with a $50 million signing bonus and no deferred money. $325 million is a record for a pitcher in the MLB by $1 million, breaking Garrett Cole's $324 million deal with the New York Yankees. So now Yamamoto is the highest paid pitcher in MLB history, and he hasn't even thrown an MLB pitch yet but he now holds the record for most total money on a deal for a pitcher in MLB history. What this tells me is that the Dodgers are dedicated to winning, and that's why I've always respected the Dodgers franchise, because they're dedicated to winning. They always spend top-tier money on their payroll, and they always have a top five system in the game of baseball. And even though Yamamoto hasn't thrown an MLB pitch yet, they see the talent, and they're willing to take that risk and give him $325 million because they think that risk is worth it for what he could bring to that pitching staff. One thing I do worry about Yamamoto is him staying healthy. Since the ball they use in Japan is a little bit different than the baseball they use in the MLB. And oftentimes, Japanese pitchers struggle with injuries and have to get Tommy John surgery at some point. Since it takes a toll on their arm going from playing in Japan to the MLB. We saw Shohei Otani get Tommy John surgery in his first few years in the MLB. And now just again this past year. And then Yu Davish has also got Tommy John surgery. And if I remember right, Masahiro Tanaka got Tommy John surgery as well. And I know that's only a handful of pitches I'm naming, but those are some highly touted guys coming over from Japan to the MLB that were great, obviously, in Japan, great in the MLB as well. But they have battled injuries with their arm in their MLB careers. So that's one thing I do worry about Yamamoto is staying healthy. But obviously, we see the talent with Yamamoto. He won the World Baseball Classic with Shohei this past March. And now in December, they both signed with the Dodgers to be longtime teammates in L.A., for the next decade. And one other thing to note is Yamamoto is only 25 years old, which is the reason he's getting the money he's getting without throwing an MLB pitch yet. 25 years old, obviously we've seen the talent in Japan, we've seen it on the biggest stage in the World Baseball Classic, and that's why the Dodgers were willing to take that risk. And it is a major risk. And there were some other teams that were involved right at the end. The Yankees offered Yamamoto 10 years for $300 million, and also the New York Mets. They were willing to take the risk and offer him $325 million dollars, but the Dodgers went out and matched that offer. Yamamoto told the Dodgers that the Mets' offer was $325 million and that that would be enough for him to go to L.A. if the Dodgers offered him that. And ultimately, I think it came down to being on the East Coast versus the West Coast. And now the Dodgers have both Shohei and Yamamoto. He was the Pacific League MVP in the Japan Baseball League three years in a row. Three years in a row, he was the MVP. So obviously, we see the talents there. And now the Dodgers' job is to translate that to the MLB which now the pitching staff is even stronger, getting glass now, Yamamoto, and even though Shohei's going to miss this upcoming season as a pitcher, two years from now he'll be back on the mound. So you'd think that would be a great offseason for the Dodgers. Getting Yamamoto and Otani, and then also adding in glass now, that would have been more than enough. But that's not where they stopped, and they haven't stopped. They just keep going, even up till today, signing Clayton Kershaw to a new deal. I'll get to that in just a minute. But they signed Teoscar Hernandez to a one-year $23.5 million deal. And now that adds power to the lineup, making it even more dangerous. I mean, that one through three of Mookie Betts, Freddie Freeman, and Shohei Otani is already strong enough. Then you add in guys like Max Muncy and Will Smith and Teoscar Hernandez and James Outman. That lineup is ready to roll. Teoscar's coming off a good season last year for Seattle. The batting average wasn't crazy, only 258, but a 741 OPS, 26 home runs, 93 runs batted in. That's a pretty good addition to the lineup. And J.D. Martinez is a free agent, so maybe Hernandez ends up taking his spot in the lineup. So after signing Teoscar Hernandez... The Dodgers owed $866 million from 2028 to 2040 in deferrals because of the contract with Shohei Otani and Teoscar Hernandez. 
Teoscar Hernandez has eight and a half million dollars of his contract being deferred. Shohei obviously has a ton. Like I've already mentioned, six hundred and eighty million of the seven hundred million he's getting is being deferred until next decade. At one point after Teoscar Hernandez signed with the Dodgers, the Dodgers spent nearly as much money as any of the other twenty nine MLB teams combined in this offseason. So after they signed Teoscar, and this is about a month or so ago now, so this is outdated. But at one point after signing Teoscar's deal, the Dodgers spent $1.2 billion this offseason. The other 29 MLB teams combined spent just $1.23 billion. So the Dodgers were spending more than every other team in the game of baseball just about all combined. And then they added even more. A week or two ago, the Dodgers signed left-handed pitcher James Paxton to a one-year $11 million deal. He was 7-5 last year with the Red Sox with a 4.5 ERA and 19 starts with 101 strikeouts and 96 innings pitched. He was a Red Sox best pitcher probably for most of last season. I know Brian Bayo showed a lot of flashes. He probably ended up being the best by the end of the season, but Paxton at first was the most consistent pitcher for that Red Sox team. And rumor had it, the Red Sox were interested in a return with Paxton. But obviously there was no deal, and I'm honestly sick and tired of hearing the Red Sox being interested in everyone and then never making a move. And the Dodgers followed it up even more. Yesterday, adding Ryan Brazier to a two-year deal. He actually went to the Dodgers last year for the Red Sox, got rid of him, appeared in 39 games for L.A. with a .7 ERA and a .72 whip in 39 appearances for the Dodgers. He was absolutely dominant in L.A., but somehow with the Red Sox in 20 appearances last year, he had a 7.29 ERA. So the Dodgers clearly know what they're doing. They find broken products, fix them, and then turn their seasons around and obviously turn back time. And that's what they did with Brazier. And supposedly today, they also have a deal done with Clayton Kershaw to bring him back to L.A. They just don't quit, and they're always focused on getting better. And here's the thing. The Dodgers now, with all the moves they've made over the last few seasons, their expectations aren't just to win one World Series. It's to win probably two World Series in the next five years. They have no option but to win after making these moves. Anything short of a pennant this season is probably a disappointment, I'd say. Their starting rotation's solid. You got Tyler Glasnow, Walker Bueller, Yoshinobu Yamamoto, Bobby Miller, Emmett Sheehan. And also keep in mind, there is a chance that Dustin May will be back at some point midway through the season, probably towards August or September maybe. Which who knows what his timetable is, but I'm hoping he's back at some point in that rotation. And this is a Dodgers team that has either won 100 games or played in the World Series in each of the last seven years. And I know they only have one World Series to show for it in 2020. I get that. I know that. But this team is talented and they're ready to roll right now. I know they've been the last couple seasons and they've fallen short. But pitching was a problem for them last year and staying healthy. If they can find a way to stay healthy, they're going to be really tough to beat in a seven-game series. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Dodgers still make another move. I thought they were done after they got Otani. That wasn't the case. Then they ended up getting Yamamoto. I thought maybe they're done after that. But with all of the deferred money they got from Shohei, it became possible that they can really be flexible with their money and sign other guys like Hernandez, like giving Glasnow an extension. They were able to do all of that because Shohei said, I'll defer all my money and give you flexibility for right now in order to win for the next five to seven years. And I thought Yamamoto would be a Met or a Yankee. I was honestly surprised that he went to the Dodgers. I think my prediction was that he would end up with the Mets because I thought he'd want to pair up with Kodai Senga. But he ends up choosing Shohei Otani instead. And I know it's disappointing to miss out on him, but a positive here for the Mets fan base is that at least they were looking to spend money. I know there were reports last year when Max Scherzer got traded and Justin Verlander got traded that the team wasn't trying to win right now and they were really just going to wait until 2025 or 2026 to get back on track and spend money. But seeing that they offered $325 million to Yamamoto shows that they want to win right now. So it obviously puts the rumors to rest that they weren't trying to spend right now. And I think Scherzer did that and said that the team didn't want to spend because he didn't really want the blame to be on him for wanting out of New York last year. But things did work out for Max Scherzer. He got a World Series last year with the Texas Rangers. So things did work out for him. I know a big question is everyone's asking, how do the Dodgers have so much money? Well, one, their owner and chairman is Mark Walter, who's the CEO of Guggenheim Partners, a firm with over $300 billion in assets. And Walter, a couple years ago, was projected to be around $5 billion as a net worth, which put him at that time as a top five richest owner in the game of baseball, which he's probably worth even more now. So the Dodgers aren't afraid to spend because they obviously have a lot of money and a lot of cash flow that they can get rid of. And that's why they don't care about spending $700 million to get Shohei. If they're winning World Series, that's all that matters to them. And then one other move I want to mention with the Dodgers before transitioning over to talking about the Red Sox is a few weeks ago, the Dodgers made a move with the Chicago Cubs. The Dodgers sent their number two overall prospect infield to Michael Bush. And they also sent right-handed pitcher Yancey Almonte to the Chicago Cubs for the Cubs' number eight prospect, a left-handed pitcher, Jackson Ferris. 
And then outfield, uh, Zaire Hope. Bush is an absolute stud. But the issue here for the Dodgers was that they have so many position players that he was stuck down in AAA, and he's probably MLB ready right now. So now he'll get a chance to consistently be part of the Cubs lineup. Last year in AAA, he hit 324 with a 1049 OPS and 27 home runs. The power was there, the talent's there. The Dodgers really just didn't have any room for him, unfortunately. And now he's going to get a chance to be part of the everyday lineup for the Cubs. And that wasn't going to be the case probably with the Dodgers this season. As for Ferris, he's only 19 years old. Last year, he was in low A, had a 2-3 and three record with a 3.38 ERA and a 1.21 whip. Looks pretty good, only 19 years old. Obviously, the Dodgers developed talent. So we'll see what Ferris is at in the next couple seasons. But the Dodgers made this move just because they didn't have room for Bush. But they're getting some prospects back in return that are young pieces that could really grow into something and have potential. Then they also got Zaire Hope, an outfield who's 18 years old, who had a 286 batting average, a 962 OPS, and three home runs last year in the Arizona Complex League. And like I've said now a couple times, the Dodgers really made this move to get room in their 40-man roster because obviously they didn't have room for Bush, unfortunately. And the Cubs benefit here. Getting a talent like Michael Bush to add to the Major League lineup to help them contend right now and try to make something happen, that's a big move for them. And I'm excited to see what Michael Bush does there in Chicago. So now I'm going to talk about the Red Sox. And obviously this has been a very quiet offseason for the Red Sox. And something the fans, I honestly think, have a right to be upset about. This past week, Justin Turner signed a one-year deal with the Toronto Blue Jays. And supposedly, reports came out that he wanted to come back to Boston. He wanted to stay with the Red Sox. But the Red Sox never initiated any conversation back, really. So Turner realized it was time to move on. Justin Turner embodied everything you want in a leader. He was only Red Sox for one season. But he was a fan favorite right away, and for good reason. Played through a foot injury down the stretch for the Red Sox. Was a clutchest Red Sox hitter all season long. And really loved playing in Boston. He loved his time in Boston and wanted to stay. Even worked out for a good amount of the offseason here in Boston. He was the high and soul of the Red Sox team last year. And it's honestly disappointing seeing him leave. With the Red Sox not even really trying to get him back. And what's really upsetting is that John Henry would rather buy into the PGA than use more money on the Red Sox. Right now he's the manager of the SSG, which is the Strategic Sports Group. Which is the group that just partnered with the PGA Tour on a projected $3 billion deal. And he did talk to the media about this deal with the PGA. With that being said, he hasn't talked to Red Sox media in years. The Red Sox this past week brought Theo Epstein back to Fenway. But not to be in their front office. According to reports, he's joining the Fenway Sports Group. And even though the report came out today that he's not going to be looking into day-to-day baseball operations, he's going to be a mentor, though, for the Red Sox new general manager, Craig Breslow. I don't think Theo completely solves the problem of the Red Sox spending money on their roster. I know, obviously, he has a great baseball eye, was a former Red Sox GM here in Boston, had a lot of success. And according to Sean McAdam of Mass Live, he believes that it's fair to say that Theo Epstein will spend more time in the Red Sox than any other part of the Fenway Sports Group portfolio. And even though that might be the case, maybe he's going to help out a little bit in the front office, but he's not going to be the GM. Maybe he's just an advisor to Craig Breslow. He doesn't solve the Red Sox not wanting to spend money. I mean, look at all the talent that's left Boston over the last three to four years. Mookie Betts, Nate Evaldi, Xander Bogats, Justin Turner. The list goes on and on and on. And I think the problem starts with ownership. I think they're really hesitant to spend money right now. So I don't think Dio really solves any of the Red Sox problems, whether he's an advisor to Craig Breslow, he sees day-to-day base operations, whatever it may be, anything from not doing anything with the front office to everything to taking over the front office every single day. I don't think it really solves anything, to be honest. Is it a bad addition? No. I mean, having him in the front office wouldn't be a bad thing. I know they said he's just going to be part of the FSG portfolio, and he's not going to be doing day-to-day baseball operations. But even if he were to be doing day-to-day baseball operations, it doesn't solve the Red Sox not wanting to spend money. And here's the thing. I think the Red Sox actually did pretty well for themselves with their coaching staff. Bringing in Andrew Bailey was great. Bringing in Justin Willard was great. Those are two great additions. But that doesn't solve the Red Sox talent issue right now. I mean, look at the AL East. The Red Sox need more high-end pitching. Everyone in the AL East is making moves, but the Red Sox. Look at the Orioles getting Corbin Burns. Look at the Yankees getting Juan Soto. The Red Sox have just stayed pat and haven't really done much this offseason. They got Lucas Giolito, but is Giolito going to be the pitcher he was two or three years ago before the MLB really cracked down on sticky stuff? I don't know. That's what the Red Sox are really banking on right now, I'd say. And to make matters worse, the Red Sox just let James Paxton walk as well, which he wasn't going to be their savior. It wasn't like they just let a superstar walk away from Boston like Mookie Betts or Xander Bogats or Nate Evaldi. That wasn't the case, which I know they traded Mookie Betts, but they essentially just let him go, especially if you look at that deal now with what we got in return. But the Red Sox let James Paxton walk. And I'm not saying he was going to be their savior, 
but he would have been a serviceable starter for them, maybe as their number three in the rotation. And the Red Sox winter weekend was a sad thing to watch on Nesson. This was a couple weeks ago now, and Tom Warner said this, I think you all know the prize at the end of the year doesn't go to the team with the highest payroll. And here's my take on it. That may be true, but typically the highest spending teams end up making the playoffs with a chance to go for the ultimate prize. Warner also said this, that the Red Sox have no plans to sell the team and look to own it for two or three more decades, which I'm sure a chant at most Red Sox games this year will be sell the team. It's sad to see what the Red Sox have come to. It really is. And Sam Kennedy over the last month also said this. He said the Red Sox payroll will probably be lower next year, meaning this coming season, than last year, while they're still building the young core of players. And here's what I think. We're the Boston Red Sox. We should not be acting like a small market team in Kansas City. We strategically have to hand out contracts and build a farm system to contend. That shouldn't be the case here in Boston. This is a big market team. And Hyam Bloom, I think, was just a fall guy for this Red Sox ownership. It wasn't really his fault. He did his job. Lowering the payroll, building up the farm system, and trying to get a winning team. Obviously, the winning team didn't really come with that during his tenure, but right away, we did a success in year two with him making it to the ALCS. But he did build the farm system and load the payroll at the same time. And I'm happy to see him get a new role in St. Louis in the front office, rooting for him to do well there in Missouri. So the last thing I'm going to mention are a few things that have happened over the last week with the Baltimore Orioles. Just a few days ago, they traded for Corbin Burns from the Milwaukee Brewers. Milwaukee in the day will be getting infielder Joey Ortiz, who is the MLB's number 63 overall prospect. They'll also be getting left-handed pitcher D.L. Hall, a former top prospect for the Baltimore Orioles. And they're also going to get a 2024 competitive balance round A pick, which is number 34 overall in this upcoming draft. Hall was a former highly touted MLB prospect. He was 3-0 in 18 appearances last year with the Orioles, with a 3.26 ERA in those 18 games. As for Ortiz, he had a 212 batting average in 15 games for the Orioles last year. He can play middle infield and third base. Seems like this probably opens the door for the Brewers to try to trade Willie Adamas. A guy I'm a big fan of. I think he's a great player. I think he'll be out of Milwaukee at some point in the next couple months. As for Baltimore's getting in return, they're getting Corbin Burns, who's entering the final year of his contract. He is a free agent after the season's over. But I think Baltimore, after trading what they had to trade, I think they're probably going to go out and give him a contract extension at some point. This team really isn't spending much money right now anyways. He is a free agent after the season's over, though. 29 years old, won the Cy Young Award in 2021 when he led the NL with a 2.43 ERA. This is what the Orioles have been waiting for. They've been waiting for a top-tier starter to help their rotation, and now they finally get their ace, which is a huge addition for them this offseason. Burns in 2023 for the Brewers had a 10-8 record with a 3.39 ERA. And now this is what that Baltimore rotation is going to look like. Corbin Burns is the ace, Kyle Bradish as the two, Grayson Rodriguez as the three, former top prospect for the Orioles, number four will be John Means, and the number five will be Dean Kramer. That's a very good one through five, with a lot of depth in pieces that you can build around for a contending team. And keep in mind this, the Orioles won 101 games last season. They won 101 games last year with a $71 million total payroll, which was second lowest in the MLB. $71 million is the total amount of money they spent on the payroll last season. And if you look at it, that was the second lowest in the MLB for total payroll. But their 101 wins was the second most in the regular season last year in the entire MLB. Very impressive. They're not spending money. They're really just building around that young core. And they still won over 100 games last season with the second best record in the regular season last year. And right now, it looks like the Orioles are going to have a $94 million total payroll for the season. Which right now is projected as the fourth lowest in the big leagues. And keep in mind, they're really doing what they're doing right now and turning the franchise around by building around their prospects. They've had back-to-back-to-back number one prospects. Now three years in a row with the number one overall prospect heading into the MLB season. That's the first time in MLB pipeline history that the same team had the number one overall prospect three consecutive years. Adley Rutschman in 2022 was the number one overall prospect. Gunnar Henderson last year in 2023. And now Jackson Holiday in 2024. Wait for this team to start spending money. They're going to be dangerous for a decade. And that doesn't even include the prospects they haven't called up yet. They still haven't called up Jackson Holiday. Probably going to be sometime this year. And they also have four other top 100 prospects in the game of baseball. They have five prospects in the top 32 right now in the game of baseball. That's just ridiculous. Wait for this team to start spending money. And here's a big thing for them. They just got new ownership. The Angelos family will be selling the club to private equity billionaires David Rubenstein and Mike Arrogetti for $1.7 billion. Supposedly, the Angelos family wasn't really interested in re-signing the Orioles' young core. John Angelos wasn't really interested in trying to bring back all those pieces and spending a lot of money. So it's honestly great for the franchise and the fan base that they have new ownership. 
Because now that probably guarantees all of those guys, like Adley Rutschman, Gunnar Henderson, are all going to get contracts some point very soon over the next year. Which is obviously great for the fan base. A fan base that has been waiting to turn things around, and I couldn't be happier for them. I'm excited to see what the Orioles look like this season and the next four, five, six, seven years that follow. Anyways, that'll wrap up this episode. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to listen to this. As always, I appreciate it. I hope you guys are a good one, and I will see you guys in the next episode. Thank you.